Hello, it's Amiga upgrading time and in this video I'm going to install a new accelerator card in my Amiga 2000 and I've always wanted to add an accelerator to it but I didn't want to go down the Pi Storm route. So after a lot of saving I purchased this new card and it's sadly been sitting behind me for quite a few months now waiting to be installed. Now I'm not the first person to talk about this particular accelerator and you may well have seen it featured elsewhere but this is my first experience with a real Amiga accelerator. So in this video, I'll take you on a tour of the Dicky Olga. So what is this new fancy accelerator anyway? Well, let's start with its name. The Dicky Olga card, according to the documentation, is actually German, with Dicky meaning fat. Why the strange name? Well, apparently, Dicky Olga is supposed to be a North German woman that you wouldn't want to meet. She's big, powerful, uncompromising and unrepentant. Hmm, <laughs> just like the card. So we've learnt about its name, but what does this card actually do? Well, over the last few years it's been through several revisions, and at the time of purchase this was the latest, and I ordered the advanced model too. And my first impressions when I opened it? Well, I have to say, for a hobby project this card sure looks professional and well made. We'll have a close look at the card in a minute, but first, the version I have has the following specification. The MC68030 processor with MMU clocked at 50 MHz a socket for an optional FPU and an optional crystal, a 40 pin and a 44 pin IDE connector, primary and secondary IDE channels, a hole in the back of the card for a compact flash card, sockets for SATA and M.2, two clock ports, one normal and one fast, a switch on the back to disable the card, putting it into so-called 68000 mode, another switch on the back to disable or enable the auto boot ROM, a socket to support the Dafina sound card, support for the map ROM tool, and uses the LIDE device driver contained in the boot ROM. Now that's a lot of features from a single accelerator card, but then, much like most things with the Amiga these days, this card wasn't cheap, so let's take a closer look at it. Unpacking it from its anti-static bag, and you can really see this card is a beast. Mind you, it's designed to fit the whole length of the Amiga 2000 anyway. Now let's get a little bit more intimate with it. Starting from the front and on the left hand side of the card, these chips, of which there are several, are all Octobus transceivers. These are just for interfacing the card with the Amiga. There's a few jumpers along the top of the card. Most of these we do not need to touch at all. This connector here is a JTAG connector for reprogramming the lattice chip here, something we shouldn't need to worry about. This is the main CPU, and below it, a socket for the optional floating point unit. In its current configuration, the FPU would use the same clock as the CPU, but you can change it using this jumper here. And once you do that, you have to install your own crystal here. There's also a nice convenient connector here for a fan, for I guess if you decide to overclock the CPU maybe. Moving across the card, these jumpers allow you to change the speed of the card between 30, 40, 50 and 60 MHz. Now 60 MHz is beyond what this CPU should technically be able to do, but some will run this fast quite happily. Then we have another JTAG connector, this one for the Xilinx chip below, and above it we have the boot ROM. Below that, I suspect that's probably our 128 megs of RAM. Now, moving across we have some more interesting bits. This IDE connector is the secondary IDE channel that can support two devices. Now you see this chip here, this is very important, it's a SATA bridge chip. It translates between SATA and IDE interfaces, but only for one device, which is why we have some jumpers below so you can change it to be either the IDE master or slave. And the jumpers next to it allow you to swap the primary and secondary IDE channels around too. Also, there's another power connector here, which apparently can be useful if your card doesn't make very good connection to provide the card extra power. And finally, this is where your compact flash card would go. There's also a few more jumpers up there, including enabling and disabling the cable select option, as well as choosing whether the compact flash card should be a master or slave device. This switch toggles the 68000 mode, and this one toggles the auto boot. Now onto the back. There's not much to look at here, but we'll start on the left, and we have an M.2 SATA connector. This one only takes B keyed cards, and it's important to note that you can only use one of the SATA ports at a time. Now you'll also notice this space overlaps where you could attach a 2.5 inch hard drive to the primary IDE connector, here. And I'm guessing the reason for this overlap is that the SATA and the compact flash connector are all also on the primary channel, and you can't have three devices connected at once. Moving along, you'll notice these headers here. These allow you to attach two LEDs, one for each IDE channel. 
Finally, on the right hand side of the card there's two clock ports. Port 1 is a standard clock port, identical to the one on the Amiga 1200. The other clock port is a fast clock port. And that's everything. However, you can theoretically connect up to four devices to this, but you have to be careful with compact flashcards, as they don't always play well when sharing the IDE channel, and sometimes they ignore the master and slave settings. So I think the first thing I'm going to do is just install the card and see it working. Now I currently have the Action Replay cartridge installed in the CPU slot, so I'll have to remove that. And I guess I'll have to also think about that dual boot kickstart ROM switch too. Hmm. I've already unscrewed the lid and opening it up we find where we left off last. And I'll start by removing the plate with the kickstart and action replay socket on it, as this is where the card will need to poke out. After this, I'm removing the action replay card too. I think for now I'm just going to disconnect the action replay cartridge from the kickstart switch and leave it over on the side. To make installing the card a little bit easier, I'm also going to make a little bit of space by moving the bracket holding the blue scuzzy. I'll sort out where that goes later on. Now to install the card, and I can tell you a lot of work has gone into the design here, the angle cut on the front of the card has been designed to help you lever it into the case. And once in, I'm firmly pushing down on the card to make sure it's seated properly. Now that was ridiculously easy to install, so let's power it up and see what happens. And it should just boot my GVP card like before, but maybe just a little bit faster. And I'm going to speed up some of these boot sequences for you too. Hmm, so no extra RAM and it doesn't really feel any faster. Let's take a look in sysinfo. After a quick speed test, and it looks like a normal system, and I can see 8 megs of fast RAM coming probably from the GVP card, although that's configured at 4 megs, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But it looks like right now this card isn't doing anything. So I'm going to power it off and flip the switches on the back, as I probably have this set in 68,000 fallback mode. And now, powering up, um, nothing's happened. Okay, maybe there's no drives fitted and I need to disable the auto boot option. Well, that seems better, it's booting this time, so it was either that or the card wasn't quite seated properly. And it does feel like it's notably booting a lot faster. Oh wow, and would you look at that, see how much fast RAM there is, that's amazing. Let's take another look in sysinfo. OK, so it's already detected the 68030, clocked at 51.8 MHz. Not bad at all. <laughs> We're motor rolling. Well, at 10,158 dry stones, you really can't complain too much. Taking a look at the memory, and first we see 128 megs of fast RAM with the highest priority set, as it should be. Then there's another 4 megabytes of fast RAM from the GVP card. This would be slower to access than the 128 megs of RAM. And then finally, the 2 megabytes of chip RAM on the main board. While I have this open, I'm going to power down and move the blue SCSI card to a different bracket, freeing up the space that it was before. You might be wondering why I'm keeping it in there at all, and that's currently because it's the only way I'm getting internet access on this machine right now. Excellent! So the card works, but we're not really using it to its fullest. So the next thing I'm going to do is install an FPU chip with a suitable 40 MHz crystal. Now the FPU might actually run fine at 50 MHz, but then again it also might be a fake, and admittedly there isn't a huge amount of software that will make use of it anyway, but I might as well populate this card out to the max. Now a nice feature of the design of this card is it allows for both the 8 and 16 pin sizes of crystals too. Now you don't have to use one, but then it will run at the same speed as the CPU. I'm also going to install a blank M.2 card and hopefully it will be compatible. And then finally, I'll connect a CD-ROM drive up to the secondary IDE connector. I've always wanted to have an Amiga with a CD-ROM drive. And lastly, as it's now a faster machine, I'm also going to put Kickstart 3.2 ROMs back in.
after that's all installed, and one extra thing I did was to change the jumper for the M.2 device so it appears as a master on the primary channel. And also, did you notice me change the jumper for the FPU clock too? I'm really excited to see this work, so let's power it up and see if I broke something. And I've booted into Workbench from the GVP card again, and the first thing you'll notice is it's asking for a disk with the icon library on it. This is because with Kickstart 3.2 there are a few libraries that are no longer in the ROM, as they simply just couldn't fit them. Lucky for me, I've already prepared a floppy disk with the 3.2 modules ADF image on it, which should just get us past that. Although it appears to be hanging, it's very strange and... Oh, there's Workbench, so I didn't break anything. First things first, I'm going to rerun sysinfo and see if it detects the floating point unit. And there it is! Amazing! I mean, it's still possible it might be a fake and it can't actually run at 40 MHz, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. So let's close sysinfo. So, I want to install OS 3.2 on the new card. But before that, I need to prepare the M.2 drive and create a petition on it. To use HD Toolbox, we need to reconfigure it to use the Lide.device instead of, well, I have the GVP SCSI.device here. And when we run it, it sees the new SCSI device. However, there's a reason we don't want to use the Workbench 3.1 version of HD Toolbox to prepare the drive. Can you see the problem? It just can't handle drives that big. I mean, it's a 250 gig drive. Kind of ridiculous for the Amiga, but that was genuinely the smallest one I could find. So we'll need to use the Workbench 3.2 version. And to make that easier, I've written the install ADF to a floppy disk as well. Like before, we need to configure it for the Lide.device. device. Only this time, when we go into it, it recognises the drive size properly. I'm going to make a small 1 gig petition. A small petition is a good idea for the main system drive because of compatibility with some software. And I'll decide what to do with the rest of that space at a later time. Once saved, I'll reboot. And you'll notice this time it fails to boot. That error is because the petition we've just created hasn't been formatted yet, but the card's attempted to auto boot from it. For now, I'm going to use the early startup menu to tell it to boot from the GVP device instead. And it's taking a while. Oh, I see, it's loading the libs again from the floppy disk. And now booted, I'll format and initialise the drive, and then rename it to Amiga, ready for installation. I'm going to try and tweak this later, but I just want to try, out of curiosity, a quick speed test between the M.2 device and the GVP SCSI card, which currently has the blue SCSI connected to it. Wow, so without even trying to tune it, the drive is three times faster already. That is so cool. So we have a drive working, and although I don't technically need to, I'd really like to try and install Workbench 3.2 from the CD directly using the new CD drive. I mean, it's there, I might as well use it. On the install disk, there's an option to activate the CD-ROM, so I'm going to have a play with that and see if I can get it to work. Now I can see from sysinfo that the CD drive is detected and it's showing up on device 3. So with that information, I'll adjust the settings on the install floppy disk and we'll see if we can get it to mount the drive. Hmm, well that apparently failed. Maybe I need to have the CD in the drive. I'll put the disk in and try again. Oh, so it did work before, it just couldn't find the CD. Well, let's get on with the installation. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't have left the two floppy disks in the drive as it's taking a little bit longer reading from them rather than just mounting the ADFs that are on the CD. But at least it's working. And amazingly for me, it's actually installing the rest of it from the CD. I'm so impressed. Oh, and I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but we have a green IDE activity LED flashing on the card too. That is so cool. And after rebooting, we've been prompted to install the extra libraries for the CPU. And once we've done that, I've started sysinfo, so you can see that the MMU, or memory management unit, on the CPU is now active. I've never had an Amiga with an MMU before. This is so cool. Now there's two or three further sets of updates needed before Workbench 3.2 is all up to date, but I'm not going to bore you with those. And also, I'm not planning on using the hard drive on the GVP card anymore, so I'm going to connect the LED on the front of the machine to the IDE interface instead. Makes more sense to me and it means I can hide the constant flickering caused by the blue scruzzy ethernet hack I did. 
There's a header on the back of the card. The header is for two LEDs, one for each IDE channel. And yes, it took four attempts to get it right. Not only the wrong channel, but as typical with LEDs, you always connect it backwards first. And that's not the only problem here. If you remember back to my original video when I installed the GVP card, I now remember that the hard disk LED on the front of the case was wired backwards anyway. <laughs> nice one, Commodore. So last up, I wanna have a play with the map ROM program, and I've never played with it before, so I wanna see what it can do. And there's one thing I want to try. You can use it to change the weight states when accessing the hard drive for better performance, and the tool apparently defaults to the slowest. To get this started, I've already copied the map ROM program to the C folder, and I've opened up an Amiga shell window. First thing I'm gonna do is run the status command so I can see how it's currently configured. Ah, okay, so weight states are already set to one. Now it will go to zero, so I'm gonna fire up sysinfo and measure it before and after. Right, well from those results, a quick bit of maths tells me it's only about 34k a second faster. Now the only issue with changing this setting is if it's too fast it can actually cause errors writing to the disk. And in the grand scheme of the speed of this thing, is it really worth changing? Well that just leaves one job of putting the case back together. Although this time I'll have to remove the blanking plate on the front to allow the CD drive to poke through. The colour match of that CD drive worked out really really well, it's such a great eBay purchase. I'm really pleased with the finished result here, but when I first got the Amiga 2000 there was a part of me that thought it was a bit of a dressed up Amiga 500 because to a certain extent it kind of was. But with this card installed however, it feels like a completely new machine and I'm going to have lots of fun exploring what I can do with it. The Dicky Olga card may be on the pricey side, but anyone with an Amiga will have come to expect this. And with the absolute amazing build quality of this hobbyist card, it's actually very well deserved. It's such a pretty looking card too, look at all those LEDs! Almost a shame to hide them all away inside the box. Hmm, maybe I need a transparent acrylic lid for it. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting, give us a thumbs up if you did, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.